They say you hone your skills by doing the same things over and over until you've perfected it. But what does that say for my expert today, who, to date, has delivered over 6,000 babies without a single mother lost in the process? Welcome to the Just Dumb Enough podcast, a show that acknowledges no one is always an expert by dispelling misconceptions with real experts. I'm your host as always, Colton Petrie. My guest today is Dr. Alan Lindemann. Dr. Lindemann is an obstetrician and gynecologist and began his career delivering babies over 45 years ago. And with that nearly half century of experience, he's here to share details on what can lead to better health outcomes, common issues, and conversations no one has with their doctors while pregnant. Lots of great information for people who want to have kids, are curious about the process, are expecting especially, or maybe even those who've already been through it and want to reminisce on how they managed to do this despite a lack of information. Let's make sure every baby and mother is as healthy as they can be. Welcome to the show, Dr. Alan Lindemann. Thank you, Colton. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on the show. Why don't you introduce yourself for everyone listening? Well, my name is Alan Lindemann. I'm a physician, obstetrician, gynecologist. I graduated med school in 77, residency in 81, so a long time ago. 45 years of learning, practicing, and teaching obstetrics uh, in healthcare deserts. Wow. And what is a healthcare desert? Is that just like there's no one to be found? Well, uh, it's where we don't have quite enough health care uh, provided. One of the problems we have now, we were in living in a county called Grant, and it's the least populated county in the state of North Dakota, which, of course, is our state, two people per square mile. Wow. So, it's, yeah, it's hard to get uh, health care here. Yeah. And you know, I mean, going into medicine is such a broad field to start with. Why'd you pick the one you did? Well, I fell in love with obstetrics back in 1975 when I had my first rotation as a third year student. Uh, one of the really nice things about OB, well, there are many things, but one of them is a rush. It's, a, you know, when you deliver a baby, um, there's just no other feeling better than that. Uh, so it's certainly a feeling you'd like to have again. The other thing that I really like about obstetrics is you get a blank slate. In other words, rather than trying to pick up the pieces, trying to fix the broken bodies, I get to define how good a pregnancy can be, and we can all aim for a perfect baby. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, with that rush, you've probably delivered your, quite a fair share of uh, infants in your time. It's about 6,000. No maternal mortality. Wow. That is an accomplishment, both in the sheer volume of babies as well as the mortality rate. Yeah. Well, it's a matter of listening to your patients. It's very important. You know, we talk about uh, elevated blood pressure being a cause of maternal mortality, and it is, but it. I have never seen it come on suddenly. In other words, there's warning signs and things you can do about it. Right. And how long do you usually, you know, hang out with a patient? Do you start from before they get pregnant all the way through delivery? Well, ideally, I'd like to see them before delivery so we can talk about what kind of how this is going to work. We can talk about what kind of bloods to order. We can talk about inherited diseases that we want to avoid. For example, cystic fibrosis, that's an autosomal recessive, meaning you get one dose from each parent. That's pretty common, and we can screen for that, and we can avoid children who have who have cystic fibrosis. Oh, very interesting. Is there quite a lot of diagnostics, you know, going into, you know, just getting pregnant and ha having this baby? 
Well, yes, you've got your, certainly you've got your baseline, like a CBC, which would tell you about hemoglobin, you know, you don't want to have anemia, you'd like to have a hemoglobin of say, at least 13, 14, or 15. You don't want to have any liver trouble, you don't want to have any kidney trouble, you'd like to have uh, no lupus, you know, chronic uh, autoimmune disease. And of course, you'd like to make sure that you're not going to deal with cystic fibrosis or some other inherited um, problem. Sure. And is there anything to, I know there's a large market for like prenatal supplements and things like that. Is that just really good marketing or are those genuinely good things to have? Well, I think it all depends on what you're looking at. Certainly prenatal wise, uh, folic acid is very important to rule out neural tube defects. And those would be like no brain um, and open spine defects and causing paralysis. So folic acid is very important, uh, 400 micrograms per day. On the other hand, if you have a family history of it or a personal history of it, uh, the dose is higher. I don't think there's any harm with taking vitamins like A and D and C. Uh, I don't think they'll hurt you and probably wouldn't hurt at all to get a little extra iron on board. So yeah, you can prepare for pregnancy. Okay, awesome. And then what kind of, like, what are the most common issues that you run into? The absolutely most common issue is weight gain. Uh, now, it's normal to have nausea and to feel like not eating. But the way you manage that is by eating. In other words, you don't want to get, you don't want to start fixing a problem. You'd rather avoid it. And the way to avoid trouble with eating is to eat three big meals a day and then three or four smaller meals. So just keep on eating and eating. You have to be careful a little bit about what you eat. For example, you shouldn't have pancakes three times a day. I probably don't need to have pancakes at all. But a good breakfast would be um, an egg or some cottage cheese or cottage cheese and an egg and an apple and uh, uh, maybe a little bit of juice and piece of toast, maybe even some bacon. But you need to have at least 120 grams of protein a day. Okay. So yeah, very much like avoid the uh, the want for ice cream and try and focus in on things you actually need for your body. Well, yes. And, you know, one of the problems we have today is that everybody's in love with carbohydrates. And that's why I was picking on pancakes, because there are people who think if you just use a syrup that hasn't any sugar in it, that you're fine. But that's not fine. Uh, the carbs in pancakes, a high carb diet is not what you need because your blood sugar will go way up and then your insulin will go way up and then your blood sugar will go way down. And that's when you're nauseated. Gotcha. So do you see a lot of expectant mothers kind of coming to you and asking questions that feel like they should have already had that conversation? You know, I have had many mothers come and ask questions, but the most common event or the most often there aren't a lot of uh, complicated questions, but there are questions and there are answers that grow out of an interview. For example, I always like to have moms, dads, and the children, if there are other children, come to every visit, partly so that I can just see how they work. In other words, do they respect each other? Do they have good communications? So that is probably more of what I do than um, field questions. But of course, if there are questions, uh, for example, will you be at my delivery? The answer is 99% of the time, yes, I'll be there. And if they ask, uh, will I see you at every visit? Yeah, the answer is yes. So those are some of the questions. Yeah. Is that something that just kind of happened to you naturally? You saw like a need for there to be the whole family unit there? Absolutely. This is something I've been working on for about 30 years. And I think it's really important because, you know, the number one cause now of maternal mortality is what we call, it's, it's three things. We call it behavioral, but it includes suicide, homicide, and drug overdose. Now, years ago, that didn't happen. 
I never saw a pregnant mother get killed or kill herself. And I never saw it in postpartum either. So this is something that is is on the rise. But I think I always took the advantage of trying to avoid those problems because most of those problems are, they have to do with environment. In other words, do you have a supportive spouse? Do you have, do you have to get up you know, every three hours to feed the baby? Can you maybe work out an agreement with your spouse so that, you know, do you alternate? So what you do when you go home has always been important to me. And that's, I think I can get a snapshot of that when my patients come to see me in the office. And yes, that is not part of what we're taught to do. Yeah. So with those things being on the rise, is that, do you think, like an environmental change as a whole, like as a civilization, humans have changed? Or is it something we are seeing crop up more in like rural or popular, like densely located places? Well, if you look at who does what, uh, for example, if you look at the suicides, these women are highly educated and they're white. Uh, and I think that what happens to them I don't think it's anything new. I don't think we are changing as people, but I think we might be changing at the way we deliver healthcare, which I think has gone down the tubes. In other words, we're not taught in medical school or in residency to see the whole family. So I expect most people don't. Another problem is that the uh, coding and billing, that when, of course, the federal government sets that up with you know Medicare, Medicaid, whatever, but there's always a push to see more people. And that means you see them for a shorter amount of time. And that means you don't know them. So I think that our, our medical care is really the problem that we're having today. Yeah. Is there, I mean, I know it's a, a humongous issue, but is there any steps you'd take to like, this is the first thing we have to do to start curbing, you know, bad health care? Well, yeah, there are many things we could do. One, you know, if I were President Biden and I could wave a magic wand, I would first of all start by by undoing most of the changes in healthcare in the last 20 years. Uh, and then I'd probably keep on with that because we had better healthcare years ago. Everybody was happier. Everybody it it worked better. So we've got that uh, problem and then of course the um you don't see the same person every time. So there's not bonding, you know. I think bonding with my patients was fun. And that's really what I really have always liked to do. Uh, it's kind of like Forrest Gump, you know. You don't know what you, uh, until you open the box, you don't know what's inside of it, you know. So you get to see, you get to know people, and you get to know how they're going to do when they go home. So maybe I can offer them something that will head off at the pass, a problem that I think is going to be a problem. And like I said, I do that. I have done it by seeing everybody, the mom, dad, children. The other thing is when you bring them all in, they bond. They all bond with the baby. I've never seen a, oh, I shouldn't say never, but it's like probably 1% of dads who have trouble bonding with their kids if they come in for the visit. Yeah. Yeah, man, it sounds like there is a a like close personal issue developing in the medical system where like you said, you know, you don't get to see the same doctor and that doctor is not seeing the whole family. And it seems like we need this community aspect to be involved in our medicine. I would love to see um, more attention paid to the psychology and the emotion of um, prenatal care. One Another problem we have is turf wars. For example, most obstetricians don't see as part of their purview to render emotional or psychological care. On the other hand, if you want to send them to a psychiatrist, it may take three months to get in. And so the obstetrician is in trouble if they render um, psychiatric care. I mean, because the psychiatrists don't like that. 
On the other hand, if you send them to the psychiatrist, the obstetricians don't want them doing obstetric care. So you have kind of a turf war and patients get lost in the middle. The other thing that's really important here, you know, if we look at these, the most common cause of death now, the CDC says that 82% of those women are either in mental health care or have been in mental health care in the last year. So even if we identify them, we're not doing a very good job of treating them. Well, and are these, you know, when people go through mental health care, obviously they can take a lot of medication. Do they ever stop taking those medications during their pregnancy? Well, that's a very good question, Colton. That's um, a big one, as a matter of fact. For the most part, the general consensus would be that if they're on something that works for them, they should continue taking it uh, because we wouldn't stop giving them um, thyroid medication or uh, whatever other medication they needed. So um, the same is true for psychiatric medication. And we don't know of many uh, side effects. Uh, as a matter of fact, most people would say that the the benefits outweigh the risks of taking psychiatric meds. Gotcha. Yeah, I know that's something that like, would be a concern of mine if I came in and I was like, you know, she's on some medication, does she have to stop? Because that medication's greatly improving her life, but can it also harm, you know, the child? There'd be a lot of those kind of questions. Well, you know, if you look at the alternatives, say, for example, you look at, at the, the benefit and the risk of taking the med, you look at the risk of not taking the med, well, then you're looking at a depression and you're looking at a potential suicide. So what's safer, taking the med or having a suicide? Well, taking the med is safer. Yeah. Is that something that, I don't know if it's part of the practice already, but do they get an increase in some of those medications to try and make up for postpartum? Well, you're absolutely right. The one, The mom who is on meds is the one that is most likely going to be depressed postpartum. So if they've already been uh, diagnosed with having depression, they will certainly be at risk for postpartum. And they certainly need the attention of a psychiatrist or somebody who can do mental health. I personally have always had my patients come in earlier. In other words, according to the American College of OBGYN and the insurances, uh, we shouldn't see them before six weeks because we talk about the uterus contracting. Well, there's a whole lot more than the uterus. There is, how are things going at home? You know, is the baby gaining weight? Is your breast milk in? Um, you know, is your, what's your husband doing? Does he stay out all night? So there's a lot of things you have to think about that have to work. Yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, comes back to the environment. Is, is your partner around? Because... Yes. Assumably, they're not always. Well, and that's another problem. Sometimes dads can have postpartum depression as well. Um, it's a little different than moms because it's more subtle and it comes on later. But one of the things that happens, if dads don't bond, I call it the Tomcat syndrome because they cut out, they leave, they do other things at night when they should be at home taking care of the baby. No, you know, in other words, they have not bonded well. These are the men, they're kind of, I think the group that's most at risk for this are the ones who are dependent on their wives for affection. And then they see that the baby's competition. Gotcha. It's kind of like having a child already. And then you have the new kid. You yep. have to watch for some behavior problems with the older child because they're not the center of attention anymore. Well, that's certainly true for dads and husbands, but it's also true for other children. You know, if you have four children, say, and you're pregnant with the fifth, it's the one next to that <clears throat> that's most at risk. Yeah. So it's kind of always the youngest child that's most at risk because they have the least exposure to this? That's exactly right. It's, that's the most competition. Interesting. So is there like a good practice to help get your, you know, youngest or only child acclimated to, hey, there's going to be another kid in the house. 
Yes, I think there is a very good practice for that, although I don't think it's commonly done. But again, if I bring in the whole family, they all get to listen. They get to see the bump on mom's belly. They get to hear the bump. You know, they get to hear the baby's heartbeat. And all of that is part of bonding so that the little one, the youngest one, knows there's a little human in there. They can start bonding before the baby's born. And is there any kind of like myths that you run into? People are always coming in and they have this like misconception that pops up and you're like, you have to just constantly knock that down with every new patient. You know, I haven't seen it a lot. Uh, most people come in pretty, they're pretty reasonable. And um, I can't think of any myths that I would be common. I think that if there are myths, it's probably from the medical field. In other words, here's something called the dock on deck. And that means that whoever happens to have that call for 24 hours is the one who delivers your baby. And there's a myth that that doesn't cause any problems for mothers and fathers, but I think it does. Yeah, especially if you're like, I've been coming to you with my partner and we're very much like, okay, when we see Dr. Lindemann, like everything's going to be good. And then some other doc walks into the room and we're like, who's this guy? You're absolutely right. You know, there are many times when, many times I've walked into a room when mother's been, she said, I can't do this anymore. And I sit down and talk to her and tell her, yes, you can do this. You just have 10 minutes left. And that's all it takes to get mom reoriented and recommitted to her labor and delivery. And that's because I know her. Yeah. I mean, it's a very intense process in all aspects. Is it pretty common for a woman going through delivery to just be like, I can't do this anymore? It, that is really common. And that's where the relationship comes in. They have to trust me. But yeah, because otherwise I assume like this is, you know, potentially the most labor intensive, no pun intended, <laughs> experience of their life. And so it would be really easy to just say like, wow, can I, can I give up right now? And you'll take care of the rest of this. And you're like, no, I need you to be here for this. <laughs> the, yes, I would say that's a fairly common uh, feeling. That is, I can't do this anymore. Yeah, and I have to assume in most cases, they do, in fact, do it. Like, they, they do get through this own th by themselves. Well, I, you're right, Colton. When I first, in my first practice, I uh, had the C-section rate. I When I got there, the C-section rate was 15%. And in uh, my residency, my C-section rate was 10%. So I went through all of the uh, C-sections for the previous three years and made up my mind that I was going to lower that C-section rate to 10%, which I actually did. So I know what has to happen. And yes, you have to be there and you have to tell them, yes, you can do this. And especially, you know, if it's a VBAC, in other words, a vaginal birth after C-section, um, they have to trust you for that. Okay. And is there like an extra complication with that? Well, from year to year, these things change. That is the warning signs. Uh, but I have to tell you, in the 40 years I've been doing it, I have not had any trouble with it ever. As a matter of fact, you know, I've been through this whole thing while well, you can't give them Pitocin. Well, yes, you can. Well, it, they can't have had more than one previous C-section. Well, yes, they can. I had a, a nurse practitioner who came to see me. She had four C-sections and she wanted a vaginal birth. So I thought, okay, fine. You know, you know what the risk is, so let's go ahead and do it. Well, she had a really nice labor and delivered a nice baby boy. So, you know, she had four girls. Now she had her little boy. And she accomplished it vaginally. So even four C-sections is not, in my experience, a contraindication. Yeah. And there are risks associated. I assume it's not like, oh, you've had one C-section. There's no more risks to doing more of them. 
Well, you know, if you look at what's riskier, the repeat cesarean section, which, of course, is just really a slam dunk as far as surgery goes for the most part. But there are still more risks. And the risks include things like damage to the ureter, which would be the tube that carries urine from the kidney to the bladder. And, of course, you can have bleeding, which is difficult to control. There is something called the cesarean hysterectomy, and that's when you can't stop the bleeding at the time of C-section, so you take out the uterus. Um, it's not a very complicated procedure, but I've never done it, and I've never needed to do it because I could always manage the bleeding at the time of surgery. Now, if you look at the risk of the uh, repeat C-section, of course, um, People get pretty excited about that. And, and the main risk is something we call dehiscence, which is when the scar in the uterus pulls apart. Can you explain that for us? Well, one of the problems of any scar is that it gets weaker. In other words, if you make it in muscle, it destroys the muscle and you're left with something that doesn't have much blood vessel and it's very thin. So yes, that can open up when you're in labor, especially if you haven't done your C-section incision um, very well. But like I said, in my patients, I have not seen it happen. They have all delivered and they have all delivered without any trouble. Gotcha. And like you said, one of those had four of them before. So if there was, yep. if there was a risk in it, like you already faced that down. Yeah. It, it, it like I said, it's, individual. Not everybody would do it. Not everybody could do it, but it worked out for that patient. Gotcha. And then I have heard it kind of equated to uh, some people on their approaching their wedding where they become a bridezilla. I have heard there is a similar thing for people approaching their birth where they have a million requests to make and it all needs to be to their exact requirements. Have you run into that? Well, as a matter of fact, yes, we have something called the, um, it's their labor plan. One of the problems with the labor plan is that the more complicated it is, the more likely it is, is not to work. Um, and the other problem is that you get too many things on the list, it makes the nurses nervous. And um, it kind of sets up a, a bad uh, relationship with the nurses. So keep it simple, you know, we, you keep your list down to the things that are very important for you. you know, if you look at what has to happen in labor to make it work well, um, just go think about how any mammal would birth. They like it quiet, dark, warm, and they have to be surrounded by things that make them comfortable, like a doula or their husband or a husband and a doula. But that makes things work better. You can shut them off. You know, years ago, we'd see mom come in in labor and then it would stop and we'd say, oh, well, you don't really know whether you're in labor or not. But actually, I think what happens is the things that we do to moms when they come in scares them and then their labor stops, which is also something that mammals do. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, it happens. So, you know, there's, we have a big obligation to our patients to keep them as comfortable and safe feeling as possible. Yeah. And I have to imagine, you know, the one in there that you mentioned, like, yeah, we keep them safe. We keep them, you know, in a room that I guess they're unfamiliar with, but it's a hospital room, so they should have some level of security. We keep them warm. The thing I can't imagine we do often is keep it dark. You're right, but it, it can be dark. It, you know, it, certainly, you know, a lot of nurses want to get the IV started right away. Well, you need a little bit of light for that. But once the IV is done and the monitors are on, it can be darker. Gotcha. So you just kind of turn the room down until it's go time, so to speak. Yep, exactly. Interesting. Are there any requests that people make for their own treatments? like as far as medically? Um, yes. You know, unfortunately today, I think there are a lot of moms who don't have requests. In other words, uh, they want to have an epidural. That's a really common request. 
I personally would just as soon not see epidurals. I'd like to see labor as normal and physiologic as possible. Uh, it's very important for moms to be able to get up, move around, for moms to walk. So those are some of the questions, some of the requests that we have. I want to walk. I want an epidural. I don't want an epidural. I want Pitocin. I don't want Pitocin. So, but we have a lot of moms today who are very accustomed to getting the smorgasbord treatment in the hospital. And Everything we can throw at them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and is there, I assume there's risks with all of those as well, where you're like, you know, any drug carries some risk. Any treatment has some kind of a risk. Well, the biggest risk for most of that is interfering with natural labor and interfering with walking. But if you start talking about an epidural, for example, you're talking about getting something in near your cerebral spinal fluid. In other words, near the nerves that go down to your feet and legs and belly. And there's always a risk of infection with that. There's a risk of infection with the Foley catheter, risk of infection with the uh, IV. Um, and the other problem with the epidural is sometimes you get really knocked out. In other words, you can have a high, high epidural and uh, you can have a headache, you can have low blood pressure, um, and that's another problem, which is usually something we can fix with an IV. You know, in other words, give them a bunch of fluid and maybe their blood pressure comes back. Gotcha. And that blood pressure, like you said earlier, is something you wanted to monitor very closely for the mother's sake. Yes. Um, you know, if you get blood pressure that's too low, then you're going to have fetal distress. So that has to be fixed right away. Interesting. Because the mother's blood pressure obviously dictates how much blood flow that the baby is getting. Absolutely, Colton, you're right. And is that kind of like some of that need to walk? Is that because it helps, you know, get things moving along? Or is it because it also helps with blood flow in some respect? I think it does help with blood flow, but I think it also helps baby settle down a little bit into the pelvis. The other thing is, I think it takes mother's minds off of their pain a little bit. It gives them another... Um, another place, something else to think about. Years ago, when women had really bad labors, they'd walk up and down steps. I know at home, my my dad's aunt uh, delivered her last baby with a placenta previa, which means the placenta was in front of the baby's head. She delivered that baby at home, but she said it was a long labor, and she walked up and down the steps a long time. Anyway, walking is good for moms. Yeah. And are there things that change between like having baby one and having baby five, even if everything has been totally normal so far? Well, baby one is a difficult delivery for most moms. If you look at the easiest labor, it's supposedly baby two. But, you know, I don't think there's a whole lot of difference between baby five and baby two. But one of the problems is that we do see certain complications like high blood pressure that increases as, I mean, the risk for that increases as moms get older and as they have more babies. So the two of those things go together, but the risks are separate. They're independent. Um, bleeding is also a possibility that is more likely the more children you have and also uh, um, unusual presentation, for example, the first baby is likely to be head first, but after that, especially at the fifth baby, you're more likely to have a breech or a foot or a hand or something else. Although I have to tell you around here, I know of a lady who had 22 children. Wow. Yeah. And most of them at home. <laughs> that is really something. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's a lot of babies. That's a lot. Is there some way, like if you catch well before the delivery, I have to assume, just for a timeline, if you kind of catch that the baby is in the wrong orientation, can you do things to realign them? Absolutely. There is something called an external cephalic version, which means you um, 
put the baby's head down or at least try to. And you can either do a forward somersault or a backward somersault. I prefer the forward somersault. And I have a little story there. When I was a resident, I had a lady come in, but she was breached and her first baby. And those are usually hard to turn, but we got it turned. And a day later, she came in and delivered head first. And then her biggest problem was she had to fix her wedding dress because the wedding dress was designed to be worn at 40 weeks pregnant. So, but it was, she was really happy to be able to shrink her wedding dress. <laughs> had to take it in quite a bit. Yep. Yeah. Well, that is definitely a change to the wedding plans. <laughs> <laughs> yep. She was pretty happy about that. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm <laughs> sure it makes for a very interesting uh, ceremony and reception, too. If you're like, yeah, I just gave birth pretty recently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three days ago. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I think this has been incredible. I appreciate all of the information you've kind of given us. Do you have any other insight or anything you want to share for the people listening? Well, one of the things that I like to do, I have a, my favorite topic right now is preventing postpartum depression. And we do, of course, have our website, realdocallen.com. And you should, we have a bunch of things. We have a blog, we have a supporter group, but go to worlddocallen.com and that should get you into whatever else you need. Um, and we do have another book coming out. Um, my wife and I are kind of debating about the title right now. It's been to the second editor, but I would like to be safe and happy pregnancy and postpartum. Um, my wife would like it to be, I think, um, your flight plan to your your delivery or something like that. Anyway, I'm thinking, let's just tell them what's in the book. You know, I mean, who doesn't want to be safe and happy? Yeah, of course. So, yeah, I mean, and that's a very like honorable goal to say, hey, I'm seeing this large issue and I'm doing things differently out here than maybe they are in much more urban facilities. And I'm seeing really good results, like zero mortality. <laughs> yeah, I think it's been, like I said, fun. And it is my goal, my legacy. Uh, I've always figured I'd live to be 100 and I've got 25 years left to work with. Let's not have postpartum depression. Let's not have suicide. Let's not have homicide. And let's not have drug overdose. Fantastic. Well, why don't you tell everyone where they can find your other books? And then when they do go find those, I will put everything in the show notes so that they can find them easily. When they do, I want them to be sure to leave good reviews so that you know they can boost your book up. And when the second book comes out, they'll boost it up and people can find it and help you know, reduce all of these things we're talking about. Well, I'm, I'm going to digress just a little bit here. You can see up there, you've got modern medicine, what you're dying to know. We wrote that 30 years ago, and it really is why healthcare costs too much. And that's available at Amazon, um, and it's Modern Medicine Lindemann. If you just go with Modern Medicine, you'll get something else. So anyway, if you want to know why your healthcare costs too much, read the book. And of course, World Doc Allen, that's where we've got, and we've got a uh, a Kindle version of the book available and safe yeah. pregnancy explained at Kindle. Anyway, yes, thank you, Colton. Yes, of course. Thank you again for being here. I've appreciated your time immensely. I hope people check your stuff out and reach out to you. And, you know, I hope you're very successful in the next 25 years you've got planned out to help, you know, reduce some of these. Well, you know, we have the opportunity to do it. So uh, we'll get, we're getting started. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Colton. Do you feel more educated after this episode of the Just Dumb Enough podcast? If so, please take a brief moment to rate the show five stars on iTunes or Spotify or Audible or wherever you're listening. If you really liked it, remember to subscribe for two new episodes every week of the year and check out the over 100 episode backlog. Let me know what you'd like to hear next by reaching out and emailing me, dumbenoughpodcast at gmail.com, or send a message to me on any of the show pages like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or wherever else you find me. 
I am always looking for new topics, guest ideas, and questions from the audience. That's it for this week. Have a great weekend. I'll see you all Monday to learn how you can earn $30,000 more a year. Wait, can I get in on this? All right, I gotta go. Bye-bye.